Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm in studio. Jimmy Bucciolato here, a.k.a. The Doctor, with my co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. And Benny's on the uh, ones and twos there. Wheels of Steel. Wheels of Steel. Uh, Thank you for listening. Just want to remind everyone, please subscribe to our podcast. And uh, we are also on YouTube. Have a uh, YouTube channel up, so please subscribe to that. By the way... I think yesterday, officially, we were up to 3,000 subscribers, so thank you. We appreciate that, and we want to keep that going. Please spread the word. Please follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Like, follow, share. We're going to try to get some of that uh, exclusive content up and moving in the next month, uh, whether it be Patreon or uh, uh, GoFundMe. uh, Yeah. We're going to do some uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube lives. and Let's make a goal for the audience. Yeah. Let's try and get to 4,000 subscribers yep. by January. Yeah, we're, yeah, I, I said to Benny and, and uh, Jimmy yesterday when we hit 3,000, I said, let's try to get to 4,000 by New Year's. So uh, that's that's the goal. Let's, uh, let's all kind of uh, get on the same side of that tug of rope and start tugging and pushing and, yeah. and uh, keep building this thing. Yeah, please. So thank you for your support. And um, hopefully uh, we'll have more resources and we'll be able to uh, um, do some Q&A. I know a lot of people have questions, especially for Bernie, and uh, we, we try to get back to you as fast as we can, but sometimes it takes a while. But it'd be nice to have a, an actual segment for kind of yeah. elite subscribers or however And maybe that, I know. mentioned to Jimmy about- we could, maybe, where They could ask you stuff in real time. Right. And I mentioned maybe bringing some some of our uh, favorite guests yeah. back for exclusive content. So stuff that you wouldn't get on the normal pod, but maybe we bring a, a Michael Francis or a Frank Panessa- uh, someone like that back, and we have them, you know, in our Patreon. And if yeah, you subscribe, you can get a half hour, you know, exclusive asking them questions, you know, the stuff right, that maybe we didn't ask them. That would be fun. So anyhow, uh, thanks for listening again. Please follow us, subscribe. Um, we are going to uh, talk about outlaw biker clubs today. That's uh, increasingly popular topic for us. Some of our most downloaded episodes are about outlaw biker clubs, and. And we're happy to do that. Uh, it's one of our favorite topics, too. And Scott has reported on some things that you can find on Gangster Report, and we'll break it down here. Um, concerning the Outlaws MC, Pagans, Mongols. So um, let's start, Bernie, start us off with the latest, and then we'll kind of yeah. go from different well, topics. Well, I think it's also, I mean, I think this is coinciding and, and lining up with a time and place in history where there is you know, quite a bit of instability and consternation and tension brewing uh, really around the United States in, in in different spaces of the of the, the outlaw biker circles. Um, you have multiple clubs that are in, you know, various states of, uh, dare I say, war. Uh, I mean, when, when it's uh, the outlaws, they're Right now, fighting wars on on three separate fronts, um, and that's not counting the government. <laughs> right. Um, right. You have the outlaws that are in their you know five decade long feud with the Hell's Angels that right. will you know, that will Goes never stop. Forever. That's a you know that's a that war that it, it started a long time ago and, and doesn't really show any signs of slowing down. So that that will always be kind of a constant. But within uh, you know other groups. You had a situation in that we've covered quite a bit, and I've, I've written about a, 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 on Gangster Report over the last four or five, last four years, three, four years, where the Pagans, which is traditionally a very regional club uh, specific to certain parts of uh, the, the Northeast and, and, and Southeast, um, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, New York, uh, have put forward this notion that they are going to expand and they've, they've called it, they've coined it the, the, the blue wave. And there was a, a blue wave mandate or a blue wave campaign that was launched by this, uh, very powerful biker boss, uh, Keith Richter, AKA Conan, the barbarian who became the president of the pagans in around 2017 and immediately enacted this expansion campaign. And that has put them at odds with the outlaws. Um, the pagans and the outlaws had always coexisted without, um, uh, without any dust ups, without any um, tension. And now there's quite a bit of tension between pagans and outlaws uh, due to the pagans 
going into different cities and states and regions that they had never been in before and trying to impose their will. Within that, this is all going to come together in a second. Within the pagans blue mandate expansion, Richter aligned with the Mongols, which is a West Coast 1% club, uh, a lot of Hispanic membership. And it was strategic because the pagans were pushing West and the Mongols already had a presence uh, in the West Coast. But from this, you've had a situation develop in the last couple of years where, you know, my impression of it is that the Mongols feel emboldened by this pagans expansion and they've decided to go off and create their own expansion effort and, and target specifically the Midwest. And the Mongols have never had a presence in the Midwest. And then uh, about five years ago, uh, you started to see some seeds being planted. And then in 2019, uh, the Mongols came into Chicago, which is really the biker capital of the Midwest along with Detroit. They opened up their first club. And in the last uh, two years, there have been at least two shootings between the outlaws and the Mongols. One uh, just occurred, and that's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, and a lot of the, the, the media in Chicago is positioning this story as, you know, a war is on the horizon between the Mongols who are new to the Chicago area and the outlaws who were founded in, in Chicago and have always claimed Chicago as, uh, you know, as their territory. You know, it's interesting, um, a few years ago, when I was in Chicago doing my uh, gang training at the National Crime Gang Research Institute or um, Center Research Center in Chicago, uh, one of the guys I met there was an Illinois state police detective, and his specialization was outlaw biker clubs. And he he predicted to me that that some clubs were going to start encroaching on Chicago, and he he said there was going to be a war. And this was probably I don't know six seven years ago. And the the reason why I bring that up is, at the time, I was thinking, okay, here's this cop with this hyperbole. Like, there's no more wars anymore. There's no gang wars. The cartels kill people all over the place. And we've seen, but, the, <laughs> and we've seen the Italian mafia right. really ratchet the violence downward Precisely, right. in the last decade to right. two decades, where murder is really not on the table anywhere near yeah. the level it was before. Right. So I, w I was thinking, and, and even at that point, the, the, the bikers, it had been relatively chill yeah. and, and i remember being i didn't say it to him but i remember being skeptical like there ain't gonna be any biker wars come on get out of here and now we're seeing i wouldn't say it's a war necessarily but we're definitely seeing skirmishes you see two you have that, two that clubs could, could, could blow uh, up three clubs in, in the pagans mongols and outlaws that are all you know uh encroaching on each other's turf yeah and kind of this 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 game of um uh, musical chairs, and I think there's a lot of uncertainty, and and I think that the biker world in America seems to be going more towards <laughs> the cartels and, and what was happening or what is happening in Canada with the Italian mafia, where there's all this bloodshed, um, as opposed to going in the direction of the Italians who are ha have moved to a, um, a place where violence is, is truly last resort. But, you know, in, in Chicago, and this is like, and it's not like they're in parts of Illinois or even parts of Chicago that don't have a lot of outlaws. Like they went right to ground zero. I wanted you to address that, how provocative this yeah. was to open up a, a chapter in Chicago. They went <laughs> to the south side of Chicago, which is where the mother chapter is. They call it the mother chapter. It's the, you know, the first ever uh, outlaw chapter. Um, you know, we've we talked about the history before. Some people date the history of the outlaws back to the 30s. Other people date it, you know, back to the early 60s. Um, the, the way that they are, you know, the modern day, Outlaw Biker Club can really be traced probably to the 60s. But, uh, you know, on the south side of Chicago, and when the Mongols got there, I guess there was some type of ceremonial, um, that all the Mongols got on their bikes, went to the mother chapter, this was like in 2019 or 20, and they did like, a, um, they circled the chapter. 
uh, there was like, you know, 50 Mongols that were riding around the, the, the mother club um, announcing their presence uh, with authority, I guess, you know, to use a term from, from Bull Durham, um, where the pitcher told Kevin Costner, the catcher, I want to bring a fastball on the first pitch, announce my presence with authority. Uh, so the Mongols did not, they weren't quiet when they came into town. They went right to the, the, into the hornet's nest where the, the outlaws are headquartered. And uh, it, it, like you said, it was very, very provocative. Um, a year later, a, a shooting um, breaks out in a, in a, in a bar um, on the south side. And then in early November, uh, in the Archer Heights neighborhood, which is right by Midway Airport um, on the south side, it's like the heart of the south side, um, in a bar called uh, Bar 171. There were outlaws uh, that were uh, there, and Mongols showed up, and you had a number of outlaws that were wounded. One Mongol was wounded. I think there was like six or seven people that were shot in the altercation. Yeah, in your reporting, you have four outlaws were... okay. Or no, wait, was that the, no, that was the, you're talking about the first, you're talking about the first shooting. Um, I believe the first shooting was in 21. The The retaliation was, for that shooting yeah. was in November. Okay. All right. Sorry, I was confused. Go um, ahead. I, I, I'm so sorry, was, there was a February 21 flare up at, where some um, outlaws got shot. And then according to what the ATF is, is telling the media, uh, the the November twenty two altercation at Bar one seventy one in Archer Heights was retaliation mm-hmm. for the Mongols outlaw or for the Mongols shooting at some outlaws in twenty one. Um, by the way, just um, for clarification, I'm looking at the official outlaws website, and uh, there's good information on there. And uh, similar to what you were saying, it it officially starts in 1935. And then it evolves throughout the decades, and then sixty three the is cl- when they become uh, a, in their words, true one percenter right. club. The club so. that existed from the mid thirties right. to the sixties really wasn't what is the outlaws yeah. today. Even though there might have been a, you know, an official founding of right. a group called the Outlaws in Chicago. Yeah. Um. So I mean, it, it's you know, I got tipped off five years ago. And I think I might have been the first person in the country to write about the Mongols um, starting to encroach uh, on territory here in the Midwest. I got a call, I think in 2017, um, that there there had been uh, um, some biker rallies uh, in the, the, the middle of the state and then in the southern part of the state. Uh, that first part of 2017 where there were kind of suddenly there were a bunch of Mongols. And people were wondering, where do they come from? Why are they here? Is it, you know, do they, do they come in peace? Do they come looking for war? Um, and we don't, as of now, we don't, from what I understand, there is no Mongol chapter in Michigan. But it looks like that was, uh, again, I'm just, I'm, I'm speculating here. But right. it seems like what they were doing in 17 was scouting. a scouting mission of some sort <laughs> yeah. to decide where they were going to put their, their yeah. chapter. It's very provocative because I know uh, from some of the people that I've talked to in the past, I mean, there's there are orders that if you see someone else's a club's patch. You like kill on sight. Right, yeah, like, I mean, no joke. Well, it's been so given a little history to the last time there was a biker war in Chicago would have been in the mid 90s. So that's 25 years ago when the Hells Angels who had never had a presence really in the Midwest before, started to um, try to come in and uh, patched over some clubs uh, in the Chicago area to, um, I don't think the Hells Angels themselves ever came in, but they came in and they they aligned with uh, clubs that were rivals to the Outlaws. I don't know if there was an ever actual Hells Angels chapter in Chicago. I think there was one, there was one in Rockford. Um, but there were a number of affiliate clubs in Chicago that were aligned with the Hells Angels that Taco Bowman, who was really the Conan the Barbarian Richter of yesteryear, uh, and Taco Bowman, Taco Bowman was the godfather of the Outlaws, 
and he's a Detroiter. He brought the um, headquarters from Chicago to Detroit, um, or for maybe it might have been in Indianapolis for a second before uh, it, it hit Detroit. But the, uh, the the headquarters for the Outlaws internationally was in Detroit from the from the early '80s uh, to around 2000. And uh, Taco Bowman, kind of like what Keith Richter did a couple years ago, where he declared war um, on anybody that stood in the way of the pagans expanding. Taco Bowman declared war on anybody that was coming into Detroit or Chicago or Milwaukee. Um, and, and the Hells Angels at that time were, were making um, a big effort to, to come into Chicago. And you had, uh, I think, at least four, four uh, murders that were tied uh, to that, um, that tension in, in 94, 95. Are you um have you been talking to some law enforcement sources in Chicago because I wonder because the guy I was talking to that this was you know whatever, yes. whatever 6 7 years ago and he was he was already worried about a war then uh, I bet now things are pretty uh, heightened awareness huh with Well I think that what I when I talked to someone a couple of weeks ago and this this again this is speculation but yes first I'll say that they seem very concerned they predicted more violence um, in the in the near future, and they said they wouldn't be shocked if all of a sudden you started to see pagans coming up here as like reinforcements or to yeah. carve out their own territory or both. Maybe both. Wow. Um, that that there could be a pagan chapter that's opened up in the Midwest. There have been really no pagans. Um, in you know in Michigan or Illinois or or Wisconsin or Indiana, uh, I know there have been pagans. I think in certain, you know, I know in West Virginia, maybe near the Ohio border, but West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania is their stronghold. Uh, Conan the Barbarians from the Long Island chapter. Um, but I guess we could use this as, as a segue to um, part of Richter's expansion. They weren't just going. Uh, west, they were going into the uh, New England area, and one of the first places that Conan um, had targeted to to start patching over clubs was in Rhode Island, and uh, the president of that club, Derek McGuire, the president of the Rhode Island Pagans, goes by the nickname the Big Tuna, and uh, Derek McGuire is a, is a husky boy. Uh, he's a younger guy. I think he's only he's, on, I think he's 30, thirty or something like that. I think he's less. Is he younger? Yeah, I think he was younger Maybe. than that. Um, and you know, big guy uh, who who was the president of a club known as the uh, Thug Riders. I think. Oh uh, yeah, right. He's thirty. He's thirty eight. You're right. Um, and I don't know how he got hooked up with with Richter, but he took some trips from. Uh, Rhode Island from the Providence area. He went to see Richter in New York. He went to go see Richter in the New Jersey and Pennsylvania, um, in the New Jersey, Philadelphia area uh, to attend some, some pagans functions and patched over all of his thug riders to become the first pagans uh, club chapter opened in New England. Um, and Which was... Traditionally, Hell's Angels territory. Hell's Angels at territory least, and outlaw. A little bit of outlaw, a little bit day. of outlaws. Outlaws have been making a <laughs> all these expansions. Yeah, uh, expansion campaigns are are spawning other expansion campaigns. So you had the Richter Blue Blue Wave mandate seems to have um, inspired the Mongols to try to expand into the Midwest, and you've had the outlaws and their new president Tommy O. John Ermine, who goes by the nickname Tommy O, he's based out of Buffalo. He's been making a concerted effort to expand the Outlaws brand in New England to combat the Pagans' push into New England. So are the Hells Angels even around there anymore? Yeah. They're in New York, I know. Hells but... Angels are in New York. Hells Angels are in Boston. Wow. They still have very strong, uh, pres a presence, a very strong presence in both Boston and New York. The reason why I ask is because if... You mean they're going to start bumping into each other? <laughs> and that's well, you already <laughs> had a situation, and I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but when we're done talking about um, the pagans in Providence, we're going to finish up by talking about a couple outlaws um, 
legal issues that we touched on back in the summer right. and that have now been resolved, uh, shootings that have erupted as a result of, of some of these uh, inter-biker uh, club squabbles and uh, give updates on, on where they stand. But uh, one of those uh, in Fall River, Massachusetts, was the, 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 the outlaws facing off against a, a group called the Sidewinders and uh, another club, and they were uh, Hells Angels affiliates. Yeah. The issue that, they, that we're going to talk about in Tennessee were a group called the Kinfolk that eventually became the Pagans. Right. But were affiliated with the Pagans when that happened. But uh, McGuire uh, copped a plea. Uh, I'm last looking, yeah, I'm looking at the documentation. He's going to do ten. Yeah. He's going to do ten years. Um, but what's what, what Jimmy and I were talking about off air? What's What's interesting is it looked for a second as if he might have been able to beat the case because yeah. they tossed all the wiretaps and there was a bunch of wiretaps that they had uh, Conan Richter, Conan the Barbarian Richter, instructing Derek McGuire on how to become a pagan and how to start the chapter and what to do and. Um, a lot of incriminating conversations that uh, if it would have gone to trial, jury would have never seen it. Well, and what heard was, it. Jury would have never heard it. And what was the controversy? They thought the warrant was weak or it was something? A, it was a dirty warrant. Dirty warrant. So explain that. You, you have a legal background. Uh, I, I believe it was a technicality in the warrant. Um, I don't think it was anything malicious. Okay. Like dirty in that way. Right. But um, it, was, it was a tainted warrant. And I, I, it could be something as simple as, and I don't know if this was the exact situation, but I'm just going to give an example of how a warrant could be, uh, how on a, technicali on, on a technicality, a warrant could be deemed faulty. So let's say that they were putting in a wire on a phone in Derek McGuire's house. Let's just, for argument's sake, say that. And on the warrant, the detective or the, or the federal agent that's filling out the warrant says, we're... Uh, targeting Mr. McGuire's house, which is a uh, a beige colored ranch, but you find out that it's more of a it's more brown than beige. That could be a faulty warrant right there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that could be a technicality, or it's red. It's not beige. Right. And it was a mistake on what the color of the house was. Yeah, that'd be a classic technicality. Yeah. So I don't know exactly. What caused the um it, it, the the term is fruit of the poisonous tree? Um, it could be it could be in some cases more like um the intel was bad, like from a not from someone who it turns out yeah is is no longer considered a credible, reliable credible, informant yeah. credible informant that could complicate that. Um, but yeah, I'm looking at uh, some of the documentation here, and this is something Scott and I were talking about earlier, which is. This guy, the guy in Providence, I mean, these are these are all organized crime charges. This is not like just a, a fight at a bar or something, right? This isn't a fight <laughs> right. at a bar that spills out right. of the parking lot where someone gets shot. Right. Um this was a these were racketeering offenses. It was a um investigation known as Operation Patched Out. And uh yeah, it it runs the gamut. And he got via McGuire got violated uh on his bond. Mm -hmm. For attending ceremonial pagan uh, functions in as a part of the effort to build up the pagans brand in Rhode Island. There was a, a, a chapter that I believe was opened up in Pawtucket, um, which is another uh, city in Rhode Island. And as part of the bond uh, that McGuire got out on, and he was being held without bond. Before they threw that warrant out, and right. when they threw the warrant out, it allowed McGuire to get out. I think he served a year and a half, uh, got out for the last year and a half or so, and then got put back in, maybe six, seven months ago, because he was caught brazenly attending this new chapter opening, um, where he showed up on his bike with his girlfriend. And it was like, uh, from what I read, it was like, or heard, it was like the scene in Donnie Brasco where, you know, they're all standing outside oh, the club and they're waiting show for the flag. For, you got to show the flag. <laughs> yeah. uh, and you had a bunch of um, pagans outside the clubhouse waiting for McGuire to get there so they could greet him. There were people watching, snapping surveillance photos. Um, 
and and he was he was violated. I think he also went to a Christmas party uh, back in last Christmas in twenty one. So he, they caught him twice. Uh, What's it called? Meeting with with uh, people he shouldn't be meeting with, uh, convicted felons. Yeah, I'm looking at the, some of the charges here. Um, possession of a firearm while delivering or manufacturing a controlled substance. I think he was in possession of firearms, which was a violation of his um, condition, too. And um, um, I think cocaine, greater than one kilo of cocaine, um, you know, uh, looking at the other charges here, um, conspiracy, drug, felony. A lot of it was drugs. Some of it was, some of it I think was straw man or like selling weapons too. Yeah, and then I calls. know that there were, you know, some instances where McGuire is going to other smaller clubs in the New England area and trying to recruit them. And in, in some cases, allegedly, I don't know if these, I don't know if this made it in, to the indictment, I don't think it did, but from talking to some of my law enforcement sources, some of this recruiting could be perceived as mm. uh, a- attempted extortion. Yeah. Where they're basically saying, hey, come along and, and join the, the pagans' uh, parade, and if they get any resistance, um, it, it, it almost becomes a muscle job where it's like, okay, now we're not asking you to join the Pagans brand. We're telling you. Sure. Right. <laughs> this is, this is some of the reporting that state police during the raid, initial raid from a few years ago, seizure of 53 illegal guns, a large quantity of marijuana, crack, cocaine, heroin, uh, silencers, a rocket launcher. <laughs> Jesus. So, uh, anyhow, I, the reason why, the reason why I bring this up is, um, there's the kind of a debate over, with outlaw bikers, are they are they involved in organized crime or are they just you know hellraisers who sometimes uh, get too you know go too far? Now, people in law enforcement, of course, say they're organized. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> to me, crime, it's, but... <laughs> when we're talking about the the big five or one percenters, these organizations exist first and foremost as a criminal enterprise, and it, I don't think there's much debate about it. I mean, there might be. Instances within that conspiracy where uh, people are just hanging out, drinking beers, and watching football sure, together. Sure. I'm not saying that doesn't exist. Of course, yeah. But uh, I think people that become members of those organizations are expect to earn, and money flows up. Um, that that's you know classic organized crime. Yeah, and and that's the important of the distinction of one percent too, because there are plenty of biker clubs that are not one. That's that's the whole point of the distinction, right? Ninety nine percent are just guys who are motorcycle enthusiasts and and hell raisers, and um, but but that's that differentiates from the one percent guys are, um, and and in the you know last thing I'll say about the Providence situation, then we'll move on and and uh, give people updates on on what we were talking about in the summer with those shootings. But, you know, and we mentioned this earlier, but Derek McGuire was in direct contact with Conan the Barbarian. Conan was, you know, relaying orders directly to him. There was no middleman. McGuire and, and McGuire um, subordinates were traveling in mass to visit and pay homage to Conan the Barbarian. Yeah. So, I mean, th- this is, uh, he might, I don't want to say he looks, you know, he's a big guy. They call him the big tuna, but this guy was a major player. Conan the Barbarian more looks more like a guy out of central casting as a scary biker boss in the same way that Taco Bowman did. Derek McGuire kind of looks a little... Uh, goofy, I guess. I, I, maybe that's the wrong way to say it. He just, he, he looks like a, like a, um, somebody you want to, yeah, like, like, I don't want to say come, go and give a hug to, but he just, he looks like a, uh, like a, like a teddy bear. <laughs> and I'm sure that, that, I'm sure that, uh, that might belie a, a, uh, a darker side to his personality. I'm just guessing. I don't know. I don't, I don't know Derek McGuire, but yeah. Uh, I just want to just point out that looks might be deceiving in, in some of that. He might not look that harmful when Conan the Barbarian looks like someone in a Martin Scorsese movie about hardcore bikers. 
Um, but I just want to make the point that McGuire was dealing directly with with uh, Richter, and Richter obviously trusted McGuire to help with the with the move uh, to expand into New England. It was the first person that he really made contact with in that part of the country, and you know it's been um, full speed ahead since then. So you know, Derek McGuire is a is I think someone to watch. For in the future, I mean, he's going to be gone for the next eight years, nine years. He'll still be young when he gets out, though. He'll get out, he'll be under 50, and, you know, maybe he's someone that, you know, has larger leadership potential. Yeah. Um, so let's go on and, and talk about a couple of the cases that were um, still being adjudicated back in the summer when we did our last biker episode. Uh, two outlaw shootings, um, or really three. Well, let's, let's give updates on three. There were. Um, one in Oklahoma, one in Massachusetts, and one in uh, Tennessee. So uh, we'll, we'll start with um, the one in Tennessee, uh, in Clarksville. Uh, you had an incident at a Longhorn Steakhouse where three outlaws got into it in the parking lot with members of a group that was then known as the Kinfolk but since then, the kinfolk have become the pagans. And the kinfolk at that point, back in, I think, 2019, I think, uh, were like on some type of probationary period trying to become pagans. And fighting with the outlaws is a great way to, be, <laughs> to show the pagans that you're a true blue pagan and, and want, want to uh, push forward their agenda, which is to, to uh, you know, fly the flag, and especially fly the flag in, in parts of the country they had not ever been in. Clarksville has, for decades, um, been uh, outlaw territory. It's, um, it's, on a, it's on the border of uh, Kentucky, I believe. And I think not- you said in your reporting that prior to this, those— those guys were on relatively good terms with those outlaws. Yeah, well, that they, they knew who they were, and and the outlaw. No, let, let me let me um split a hair here. The president of the kinfolk, one of the guys that was killed in this incident, uh, John Allgood, Allgood, who they called Deacon. Deacon was on good terms with all of the outlaws. Okay. Um. He was this, you know, OG in the area, even though he wasn't an outlaw. Yeah, but was I think known as more of a diplomat. Wasn't known as a violent bike crazy biker. All these people involved in this incident in in Clark's uh, Clarksville were all military vets, so they all had yeah weapons training. And, yeah, uh, but you had a situation where you had a um prospect, an outlaw prospect that again was probably trying to prove his merits to his. Uh, his brothers or the people, you know, the, the, the members of the outlaws that, that were going to bring him in to the fold as a, as a fully patched member. He was going to meet these guys. He's driving uh, past a Longhorn Steakhouse. He sees some motorcycles in the parking lot that he doesn't recognize. He goes into the Longhorn Steakhouse, sees these members of the kinfolk, sees this guy named Jimbo Ramsey. Depending on who you talk to, he either grabbed Jimbo Ramsey's kinfolk vest or he tapped Ramsey on the shoulder. Either way, he made contact with Ramsey. Ramsey got upset by it. The prospect leaves the Longhorn Steakhouse, goes and meets up with two of his outlaws, uh, fully patched members of the outlaws, Mike Kraft and Jackie Davis, known as Hulk and Rapper. And they meet up at a, at a bar called the Tilted Kilt. They're there for about 45 minutes. They leave the Tilted Kilt. They go back to that Longhorn Steakhouse. Um, at that point, it looks like they're going to try to work it out with, with Deacon because they know Deacon. But Ramsey, by reading, I read the police reports, it looked like Ramsey like, lost his mind. And Ramsey started in the middle of the parking lot, pulls out his gun and starts waving it around, screaming very erratically, threat, you know, making threats, swearing. Deacon is trying to calm him down. You had the other outlaws that were in the same vicinity. I guess Deacon started screaming at the prospect, saying, this is all your fault, basically. Yeah, yeah. 
The prospect Instigated. then headbutted Deacon, and then the shooting erupted. And uh, Deacon was killed, and Jimbo Ramsey was killed. Although, it, according to your reporting, just if we can get into the yeah. specifics, all good grab the outlaw first. Okay, right. So he put his hands on him first. Puts his hands on the prospect. Right. To basically say, you're a dumbass. You caused all this. I'm mad at you. Yeah. But if you put your hands, right. it's, it's sort of like a tally, like made guy. <laughs> like, yeah, but this is a made guy if you want to uh, sure, yeah, putting his different. hands on yeah. a guy that's almost made. Almost made. Yeah, not made yet. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, but, Although then, you, then it gets political here because- Outlaws carry more weight than some associate clubs. Right. So where's the where's the uh, you know I, I don't know how you ne ne negotiate or navigate through but that. The, but at the end of the day, uh, Mike Kraft, Jackie Davis, and the prospect uh, Zach to Black are all charged with first degree murder, which seemed like an overcharge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's it's been resolved now where Kraft, Davis, and Tay Black have pled. Guilty to manslaughter, second degree murder, and in exchange for a sentence of three years, they've been in jail now since 2019. So they're basically agreeing that we'll we'll cop to a manslaughter. The state will acknowledge that you, as the shooters, had a right to defend yourself. Right, and we're going to give you a sentence that you've basically already served. So all these guys, if they're not out now, they'll be out by early January or February probably, and it will all be behind them. Um, they're not looking at life in prison anymore, and it looks like they are vindicated to a degree. And then, and since then, that associate club patched over to the yeah, pagans. Yeah, since then, the kinfolk are now the pagans, and now there's a, a pagans chapter in Clarksville. Whoa. So... um what, what, where, does Clarksville, just, where does this end? Where does this? This seems like this. There's potential for this yeah, to get really I, ugly. And I, I think I said this, but I just want to reiterate: uh, Clarksville is on the Kentucky border. It's almost more Kentucky than Tennessee. Um, I didn't really even know what Clarksville was until I had to look it up. And, and you know, it's, it's not in the Memphis area. It's not in the Nashville area. It's not in the Chattanooga area. It's kind of its own little world in Tennessee. And so we know that similar to, to the, I wonder what your sources are saying, because we know similar to the Italians, when, the, when there are these um, territorial disputes or, or disputes over rackets, they have sit downs. The bikers do too. They have their own version of those. Um, as, as ever since this thing, I mean, are, are there, have, have there been um, any diplomatic yeah, I conversations? I don't know, but I would two? just, again, Speculating here, I would guess that the fact that Deacon Allgood was killed in this altercation doesn't bode well for future That's what I mean. diplomatic relations when he was the guy, he he was the, the voice of reason yeah, from what he, I heard. And now he's gone. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, That's what I mean. He this... was the guy that had the good, re the good relationship with the outlaws. Right. Right. Now he's out of, he's gone. So I just wonder what the future... Um, well, I think the, the there's just it, 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 kind of everything right now with the outlaws is, is tenuous in regards to some of these territorial disputes. I mean, I don't see them going away. I don't see the pagans picking up and saying, all right, you know, the blue wave mandate, that was cool for four or five years, but we're done with it. Yeah. Um, I don't see the Mongols saying, you know, uh, we flirted with coming in Chicago, but now the newspapers and the ATF and, and Bernstein and Bucciolato over at OG Podcast, they've got a hold of it and they're talking about it. So uh, maybe we'll call it a day. <laughs> yeah. And what, uh, just, just at a sense of scale, um, a chapter like uh, in a smaller town like this, are we talking like a dozen members? I mean, what, what would you say? Yeah, I don't know. So, okay. I don't know. Because in like a bigger chapters, like in places like Chicago and Detroit, you can have a lot of guys. But some of these smaller towns, I think, tend to, as you might imagine, that I wouldn't be shocked if huge. Clarksville had twenty, thirty guys. Okay, all right. Um, let's move on to Oklahoma. This will be quick. Uh, there was a, a shooting on an expressway or a highway in Oklahoma between pagans and outlaws. Um, pagans had not ever been in Oklahoma before the last couple of years, they've come in and immediately have butted heads with the outlaws. Um, the outlaws had been, I don't want to say dormant in Oklahoma City, but uh, a lot of guys had been incarcerated from a bus in the 2000s. A lot of those guys started to come out 
of prison in the 2010s. And I think that outlaw chapter uh, is starting to kind of reform to, to where it was uh, in the 90s and, and 2000s. And that, that chapter, the Oklahoma City chapter, was opened in 1977. Um, the guy, one of the original seven um, uh, uh, OG members of Oklahoma City Outlaws was a guy named Arlo Nelson, Virgil Nelson, they call him Arlo. Um, there's debate about what Arlo's position right now is. The government will tell you he's the godfather of the outlaws in Oklahoma. The outlaws will tell you he is a very legendary outlaw that there's a lot of rev- reverence towards, mm-hmm. but is not the he's boss. Not, he's not okay. He's not the shot caller. Right. Either way, he was arrested for murder in that shooting, um, and he's been exonerated. Uh, it's been the the um, security footage of the the. Um, Places of business that lined that highway where the shooting occurred uh, showed that um, Nelson wasn't one of the shooters, um, that it actually could have come from one of the pagans. The pagan that was killed in the incident was a military vet, younger guy. And, uh, but, but, Arlo, but Arlo Nelson is now uh, exonerated from that, doesn't have to worry about a murder uh, case hanging over his head. And we'll go back to either Leading, leading the outlaws in Oklahoma City and putting that back together to the way it was in, in his heyday. He's a, you know, a, an older man in his uh, 70s, I believe. Or he'll just be what they claim he is, which is kind of an elder statesman um, there for counsel and advice, but yeah. uh, not central to the uh, Emeritus. day-to-day, day-to-day shot, shot calling. Yes. Another thing that I just think of like comparative is um, how some of the high-ranking guys are directly implicated in these crimes so like yeah like mcguire like i mean he was the president president selling drugs selling weapons uh some cases guys implicated in shootings i mean i know this guy was exonerated but um some other crime organizations usually the 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 privilege of being the boss is you should you should be insulated right? that you're not you're not handling dope you're not you're not shooting anyone you 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 did those things coming up but like um that's the that should be the the privileges that go with being the shot caller is that um, you're insulated that the rank and file are, are the guys on the street so it's kind of interesting that it's cultural differences. Well, let's finish up with uh, what happened in, in Massachusetts and this was one of uh, the cases that I I enjoyed uh, deep diving because you know we always talk about our love of pop culture and, and finding you know where art imitates life or life imitates art. And uh, in in the situation that occurred in uh, Massachusetts, you had a a guy, uh, little Joey or little Joe No mm-hmm. Noe, who a lot of people call the real life Jax Teller. He's another younger guy, a younger yeah. guy whose dad was a founding member of the Outlaws in New England, um, in Boston, in the Boston area. Uh, uh, came in, I believe the the Boston Outlaws were were formed in the, at some point in the eighties. Um, his dad, uh, Joe Dogs, was the president of the Brockton chapter, I believe. And uh, little, so he's got the pedigree, right? And he he's not he doesn't look exactly like Jax Teller, but there's some you know blonde hair yeah, yeah. and a younger guy that's being kind of groomed for leadership, ha- has a lot of swagger. And uh, seems to be a popular guy. And there was a incident uh, a couple years ago where he was charged with a first degree murder. Um, it looked a lot like, at the very least, manslaughter. What it really looked like was self defense. Yes, it, right. And he went on trial, a first degree murder trial, um, last month or two months ago. And the jury acquitted him very, very quickly. Yeah, um, it was a situation where him and his uncle and his girlfriend or his fiance had gone for a drink. Um, it, they lived in Fall River, Massachusetts, and and little Joe No had been sent from Brockton to Fall River to try to get the Fall River Outlaws chapter up and running. This is again all part of this expansion. <laughs> the outlaw expansion. In response to the pagan expansion in New England, uh, Tommy O, uh, and I don't know who told Little Joe No or No. I don't know if it's pronounced No or Noe. It's N O E. 
Um, but uh, he, he went and has helped over the last couple of years get the Fall River chapter up and moving. Fall River is this, um, this mill town located halfway between Providence and Boston. Um, it's like an ethnic melting pot. Uh, a lot of Italian, a lot of uh, Portuguese. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting area. And um, there was a bar, I think it was called JC's. It was a the popular biker spot. They had put in a, a, a rule where I, I think there was like there was like a no color rule mm -hmm. because there was a lot of biker dust ups. Mm -hmm. And um little Joe and his fiance and his uncle went for a drink. They did not have their colors on. I think they took their colors off particular specifically to go to this place. Right. When they went there, they were encountered by a bunch of sidewinders. And uh, there was another club's name, and I'm blanking on yeah, I can't remember right now. The, uh, the maybe the Black Hand, I think it was called. But there, there were two clubs that were affiliated with the Hell's Angels, aligned with each other in Fall River, had issues with the Outlaws just because of the dispute between the Hell's Angels and Outlaws, which which go back uh, quite a long uh, quite a long while, and. These guys, based on the security footage from the establishment that night, the whole like hour, hour and a half that little Joe and his uncle and his fiance are there, these rival bikers are going back and forth from the parking lot. They're on the phone. It looks like they're calling for people to come and, and, and start up a fight. Yeah. And little Joe uh, is leaving and it looked like the sidewinders knew that the reinforcements hadn't come yet and they wanted to stall little Joe so that they didn't leave right. before all the rest of the sidewinders showed up. And uh, so there was an altercation as little Joe was leaving to try to go to the parking lot. One of the sidewinders, I think one of the leaders uh, got into his face and they had to be separated by staff. And then little Joe and his fiance and the uncle come out to the parking lot, get on their bikes, and right as they get on their bikes, there's about 22 sidewinders that show up. Yeah, they surround them. And right? they surround them, and uh, at one point, one was was uh, swinging a hammer and at hit, the and, fiance, and hit almost the hit the fiance. Yeah. No, that was, almost hits the fiance. Little Joe had a gun that at that point, he pulls out, he had a permit for it, shows it, and at that point, they disperse from little Joe and his fiance, and they go and attack Joe's uncle. And as, um, I, I don't have the article in front of me, and I'm blanking on the name of the guy that died, who was killed. But the guy that was killed was a sidewinder that had a object, uh, a blunt, blunt instrument that he was swinging was it a pipe or something? I can't like a remember. Pipe was yeah. about to swing it and bash little Joe's uncle's head in, and little Joe shot him and killed him. Yeah. Um, and by the way, his uncle still had to go to the hospital for a cracked skull. Yeah. And it was in the hospital for a period of time. Uh, so it, it definitely did not look like a first degree murder. No, I, I can't believe it. that. Yeah, I mean, I, both of these situations, it seemed like there was overcharging going on by the prosecutors just because they were charging out all bikers. Yeah, they right. I was just suspecting that it was political, but it was a you know it was a week long trial in Fall River, um, and I think the jury was out for like a half hour. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I wasn't there. I didn't see any surveillance video, but from your reporting and some people, I read that, the police report. I read the police report. Yeah, and people that have contacted us on social media. Um, it seems to me like it was a very cut and dry self defense, um, and that, in all likelihood, the prosecutor was. Well, there's you have a, this a, is a political thing. It's Send a, a message. It's, like a, it's a it's it's a, a law within the self defense law that's like a it's a third person duty, where like the the state was arguing, you, you that was your uncle had a right to defend himself at that point. You had no right to shoot into a crowded right. group of people. Um, but there's a a law within self defense that if if a, a third person is in imminent danger yeah. of being killed, you can step in and and uh, kill the person that's going to kill the person yeah. you're trying to protect. Yeah, I mean, God forbid you're at a 
public space and some mass shooter is there. If you if you got a piece on you, oh, we saw it. It happened. Take a couple, out. It happened a couple months ago in Indianapolis. Yeah, it was right after the 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 uh, July Fourth shooting in um in in Highland Park, Illinois, and like a week or two after that, a guy went into a a, a mall in Indianapolis and and opened fire. And before he hit anybody. A dude that had a, a a permit to carry, yeah, killed him. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, good. But uh, so yeah, we just wanted to give you updates on that. But uh, you know, this was uh, a nice little primer for where we are headed into 2023 with uh, the biker landscape in America right now. It's it, you know, there is a lot, a lot of. Uh, simmering brewing tension that is kind of undercutting all of these clubs um and i i at least in the time that i've covered organized crime and for the last 15 years and i've covered bikers that whole time i i, I don't recall a time where there was this much rivalry and and bubbling animosity between multiple biker groups in multiple parts of the country yeah that it seemed to be there seems to be an incident that's popping up every couple months yeah that's what i mean that's why i was skeptical when the illinois uh state police guy said there he thought there could be a war because i they're always skirmishes but they're usually very localized this is this is different this seems like uh a national thing, not yeah, not just a uh, some kind of a localized skirmish between rival clubs. There's, there's another thing I want to mention as we close out. As the pagans have decided to align with the Mongols, as well as some other Hispanic, um, I've, I've heard some Latin kings might be involved in some of that. Oh, Chicago. Uh, well, just what the pagans are doing in terms of who they're aligning with. Oh, yeah, I've heard that in their push west and up into the northeast that in addition to aligning with the mongols they've aligned with the latin kings wow the response by the outlaws has been to align with some african-american street gangs which is unique yeah and reestablish and reaffirm their ties with the italians um and you see that in buffalo with with Tommy O. Yeah. Who I don't know really I know a lot about Conan the Barbarian. There really hasn't been as much out there to consume about Tommy O. I can only glean what I can from my street sources and my law enforcement, but there's no like court documents really to dive into who Tommy O is. But we know for sure that Tommy O is very, very close to the Buffalo Italian Mafia. Yeah. He works at the strip club that is controlled by the Buffalo crime family called Pharaoh's. He's the head of security. The entire security detail at Pharaoh's is made up of outlaws. Mm -hmm. And Pharaoh's is owned by the nephew of the reputed Tadaro. godfather of, of Buffalo, Joe, Big Joe Tadaro. Well, then Kings have a lot of, um, a lot of um, muscle, man. You know what I mean? But that could be pretty formidable if, they, if they're forming alliances with but that makes sense you know, because they because they align with the Mongols, right? And that shows that the leadership of the pagans now, Richter, and 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 I should also mention Richter should be coming out in the next couple months. He's been in prison for two years on a on a gun case, and and he'll be out by uh, early twenty three. And it should be interesting to see how his return to the streets is is welcomed and and what it uh, ignites. But um, you know with you know, with, with with what we're seeing now with the the outlaws, it doesn't surprise me that they're kind of doubling back because we've known that there's been an, a, a parallel or an alliance between the outlaws and, and the Italian mafia. Oh, families. going back a long in time. Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee. Um, but just like it was kind of eyebrow raising to hear initially a couple years ago that the pagans and, he, and also let's outside of like mongols and vagos and banditos who have the uh hispanic memberships most of those other biker groups are like white nationalists no 100 percent. so to hear 
you know, to first hear that Richter was encouraging the recruitment and the filling of the ranks with Hispanics, his number two, his vice president, uh, Hugo Nueves, who they call Zorro, is the number two man in all of the whole Pagans organization. He's Hispanic. So that was a little eyebrow raising. But then now to hear that the reaction or the the counterpoint to that or the you know the chess game is then for the outlaws to go into Chicago or, or into Detroit or wherever and 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 link up or click up with with African American street gangs. I mean that's just that seems a little hard for me to believe. Yeah. Well, I mean Kanye's out there <laughs> repping Hitler and yeah, the Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> He's a black dude. But I, it, 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 Stranger it, Things. It, it things speaks happen. to where, but doesn't it, in both of those strategic decisions by Richter and by, by Tommy O, I mean, don't, don't, in both of those organizations, don't that, that speak to where we are here in the 2020s and how, you know, it, just like we've talked about with the Detroit and the Chicago mafia families, it doesn't matter if you're Italian. It doesn't. If you can make them money, if you can help them reach their goals, if you can help them push the needle, expand the brand. Yeah. You know, it, it's, 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 it's tribalism at its like, at its purest form. Well, I mean, uh, multiculturalism is a, is a real thing. And, um, it's happening in society at the macro level and throughout corporations and higher guess- ed and everything. And so, it, we shouldn't be surprised then that those trends also manifest themselves in the underworld. I guess I, I said it's tribalism at its purest form. That's actually probably false. It's probably the opposite of that. No, that's that's why I was saying multicultural. It's yeah. like it's yeah. the, it's a repudiation of that entrenched old school right. tribalism. Tribalism would you would be yeah introverted. You wouldn't you right. would you wouldn't fuck with people from the outside. But no, I mean multiculturalism. It's 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 the reality, and so I don't think we should be. Surprised that um, those trends uh, emerge in the underworld, just like social media is something that's in the mainstream, and it didn't take long before people in the underworld were. I can't were, imagine a world without social media. <laughs> right. So, so let's uh, just finish up. I'm gonna get a. I'm gonna get a uh, a release date on Richter, and that's how we're gonna end. Um, I think it's March. Uh, but. You know, I think our next episode that we do biker wise will probably be when when Conan gets out and we'll, we'll maybe take the temperature. Um, I'll talk to some people that uh, in the Pagans organization and, and talk about his return because I'm sure it will be with quite a lot of fanfare for him to come back. He is a beloved figure in the Pagans. You know, he is a a true force of nature. Uh, a lot of people compare him to Taco Bowman. And I think that's an app comparison, um, just uh, force of personality. Okay, so this says that he should be out in July, which means he'll be in a halfway house by March. Mm. So he's 63 right now. He's in New Jersey. So I, I'm looking at this right now. So he's been serving his time in New Jersey. So I'm pretty sure... He ain't that far removed from from shot calling on the streets, even though he's locked up, even though he's given um, away the president title. Uh, a guy named Big Bob Francis took his place. He's a seat. You know, from what I from what I've heard, it's it's kind of a situation where Big Bob is just keeping the seat warm. Um, Big Bob was this kind of long time uh, outlaw that uh, people thought, you know, let's give him a leadership position as a reward for all of his loyalty. But you say outlaw, you mean out in a generic outlaw biker. Right, because right, right, they're pagans. Pagan. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yes. And it, it, I can't remember, is Conan in state prison or feds? Conan's in feds. He's in the feds, okay. So he's in New Jersey, so I'm sure. I mean, that's right. I mean, Jersey's the, the heart of, yeah. of pagan territory, so I'm sure people have been going to visit him, and he's been able to get word out on the street, even if Big Bob is the official... Uh, a uh, president there, but you know, I, I'd be I'd be shocked if Richter comes out in the spring, and and by the summer isn't leading the pagans again. Yeah, well, we'll monitor it, and uh, I, it seems to be a popular topic with our audience, so we're happy to to discuss it. So, anyhow, thank you for listening again. Please follow us on social media, and please subscribe. Uh, I am Jimmy Bucciolato, Scott Bernstein, and we are out. <laughs>